Hi, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society, and I'm lucky enough today to be joined by Dr. Gloria Richard Davis. She's the executive director for the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at University of Arkansas Medical Science. Additionally, she serves as division director, reproductive endocrinology and infertility, and is the medical director for the physician assistant program. She has also served on the board of trustees for the North American Menopause Society. Welcome, Dr. Richard Davis. Thank you, Marla, my pleasure. Great to see you. So let's start. Given the number of options of preparations, the different routes, dosing, formulation, um, it can be confusing for uh, healthcare practitioners in terms of deciding what to start and how to start. Are there some general guidelines or tips that you can offer us to help us in that direction? Absolutely. And I kind of think of, of prescribing hormone therapy the same in the same vein as, as how we prescribe oral contraceptives, right? Because there's a whole plethora of options there as well. So when we think about some of the, uh, some of the factors involved in how we choose which preparation, we all kind of set up our own protocols and get comfortable with, with uh, how we choose preparations and how we discuss that with our patients, right? So, you know, of course it's, it's looking at uh, patients' risk factors. Are there any reasons why they can't use one preparation versus another? And then uh, it is, when you think about route uh, of administration, if they are, if they're someone who is not very compliant with oral preparations, then you may want to lean towards a uh, patch or transdermal or, you know, sprays, some other options. And then of course, depending on their symptoms, separating into whether we're talking about a systemic uh, need versus a local need vaginally. And that of course takes you down a whole nother track. Um, any risk factors that needs to be considered like family history. Uh, we have lots of patients who have uh, breast cancer phobia. So, you know, you're, you're kind of walking through all of these different factors and in your mind check marks so that when you get distilled this down to a conversation with the patients, you can come up with what best fits her. And the other aspect that I think we need to consider is obviously cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, does insurance cover it? What tier is the preparation covered at? I do, and I'm sure you have gotten many uh, portal uh, patient portal messaging, asking for a more economical option. And so just having that conversation with patients, you know, upfront. So general, we, you know, we can consider um, a patient preference for a route, but if we're looking at, at uh, an evidence-based preference in terms of why we might order one thing over another, let's talk about the difference between an oral versus a transdermal preparation. And when you might be you know, sitting there saying, no, I think that there's clearly a benefit of one over the other, who might that patient be? So, you know, that's a great question. And it's really a very complicated question because, you know, when you look at effectiveness of whether it's oral or whether it's patched, they're both effective. There are certainly some theoretical reasons why you might wanna choose a patch over an oral preparation. When we look at first pass effect in the liver, we know that oral preparations increases the production of, of coagulation factors. Um, it does not have any different effect on the lipids than the oral preparations. Um, so those are two pretty big distinction between the two. And there are some studies that would suggest that the transdermal preparation has less risk factors as it relates to thromboembolic events. But there's never really been a head-to-head -head comparison of the two. And so, you know. Well, it begs the question, is it really the transdermal or is it the lower dosing that we've now gone through? Does dosing trump the delivery system. And that often is a question that we get asked. Absolutely, and that's, and that's a great point because uh, we know that when we initially started prescribing hormone therapy, we started with more of what I guess now would be considered a medium dose, not a low dose. And so now we're starting with the lowest 
uh, effective dose. And so you are gonna see less impact on coagulation. So that brings me to looking at, you know, the newer versus the older preparations. So if we go back to the Women's Health Initiative, looking at the preparations that we're using then with a heavy emphasis on a progestin over a, a progestogen over a progesterone in the class of progestins um, and a particular type of estrogen of the newer preparations that are out there looking at all the now using that word bio, you know, identical in terms of an estradiol and using a progesterone, are there benefits to the newer preparations over the traditional older preparations that we used to use or are continuing to use? So, you know, some of the things that we know from our previous publications, when we talk about synthetic progestins versus micronized progestins, there were uh, historical studies which said the micronized progestins is probably safer. When we look at the um, women's health study, which actually used a synthetic con conjugate equine estrogen plus um, hydroxyprogesterone, so a synthetic preparation. Uh, when you compare the older preparation with perhaps something that has more bioidentical, or if you are using a preparation and you're uh, combining it with a bioidentical progestin, there is theoretically some benefit. We know that one of the newer preparations on the market is Bijiva. And that of course is a bioidentical FDA approved preparation with a combination of estrogen and a progestin or an, you know, micronized, a natural progestin. So that's one preparation that potentially has uh, an advantage. And we also know that many of our patients are spending you know, mega dollars on compounding preparations because they are trying to use what is most natural. And the reality is we don't sanction the use of non FDA approved products, um, but the patients don't necessarily appreciate the difference. But if we can at least say to them, look, this is an FDA approved product that is comparable, you know, it's bioidentical, right? And so will that in fact uh, allay some of the patient's concern? And now we have newer preparations uh, for women who have intact uteruses that are progestin free using a serum such as basidoxifene in fixed combinations, yet another option available for Absolutely. women today. Right, right. And you know, and when I think about uh, uh, the TSEC or the, you know, the preparation that has basidoxifene in it, with that serum added, it also potentially has some benefits of decreasing breast cancer stimulation, breast cancer risk. So, you know, just thinking about those preparations yeah. in that way. And now in, in Canada and um, not the United States yet, but in Europe, we have Tibolone being offered as well, which is a completely different uh, preparation, different steroid preparation also now that is useful for management of vasomotor symptoms. Let's right. move on to looking I, at- um, We still don't have that, okay, in the US. <laughs> we, we just got it, we did just get it. So. <laughs> We're just getting comfortable and familiar with it. So looking at VVA as a subset of GSM um, and looking at the traditional different estrogen products that are available, now we have newcomers on the market as well. We have an oral serum that's available, and then we also have a DHEA vaginal preparation that's also available. Is there a benefit? Um, of one to the other and what might you think about when you're looking at either adding on vaginal treatment to a low dose systemic that's not doing enough or just using a pure vaginal um, option or an oral option because the only symptom that they're having is VVA subset of GSM. What might you be thinking about? So, you know, if, if we're talking about just GSM, then obviously my focus is topical. And when you talk about the differences in the preparation, any any estrogen preparation will be effective. The newer preparation, which you just mentioned, enterosa or vaginal prosterone, DHEA preparation. Uh, some of the theoretical benefits there is it's a non-hormonal, quote unquote, right? Non-hormonal preparation, uh, but it is converted to estrogen and androgen in the vaginal mucosa. And there are some studies to suggest that in addition to alleviating symptoms of GSM, there may be some benefit for women who have hyposexual desire disorder. And uh, in fact, I just got approved for a, an invest, uh, 
in investigator initiated study, right? Looking at breast cancer survivors in using this preparation versus placebo, because we know that those particular patients oftentimes or diagnosed earlier, they have problems without the use of estrogen. And so we are really excited by being able to look at that in, yeah. um, in an objective way. We'll be looking forward to that data. A final question. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use hormone levels in managing hormone therapy patients? So, I mean, the general answer is no, but there, are, <laughs> <laughs> but there are a few exceptions, right? I mean, occasionally we all have the patient who, despite what we have prescribed to them, they don't seem to get alleviation of their symptoms. Then I'm concerned about, especially if they're using, let's say a transdermal preparation or spray, you know, gel, are they absorbing it the way that they should? Is the patch staying on the way that it should? So there might be an instance where I would get an estradiol level in those patients. Um, as well as, you know, when we, we think about oral preparation and the bump in the sex hormone binding globulin that binds the estrogen, binds the androgen. So if you have someone who, uh, who may be having uh, symptoms of androgen uh, deficit, then I may want to look at levels in that sense. Um, but that's probably the only indications that I would see for using levels. Important information because so many people think that they need to have their levels done to be able to, uh, you know, identify and treat them individualized. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been terrific. Thank you.